in our, our series. I, I've got a special guest here with me today, Michael Volpat. Michael, I'll introduce in just a moment. He is full of information and knowledge and a great resource for everyone. Uh, but I'd like to share with you the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce's mission mm -hmm. and our vision. Our mission is to protect and promote America's emerging economy. What means is, is all businesses that are moving towards sustainability. And our vision is, is that businesses are the solution to a fulfilling life, to a healthy planet, and to a thriving economy. And we think that many people would agree. Now, at the U.S. Green Chamber, we have three areas of focus. Number one is education. We want to make sure that you have the latest information, not just on sustainability, but how to build and grow a thriving business. We also focus on a business network. You know, our goal is 100,000 small businesses in the United States that are all connected, that are all supporting each other, that are all growing and protecting this thriving economy. And third, but definitely not least, is advocacy. We want to make sure that every sustainable business has fair representation at the White House to make sure that we have a fighting chance with the laws that are being passed. So that's really what the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce is here to do. And today is a part of our education uh, program. We're really grateful for our national media partners and our sponsors, uh, of which our guest today, Michael, is one of our main sponsors and has already made a huge impact to make sure that the U.S. Green Chamber mm -hmm. is sustainable in itself. So without any further ado, I'd actually like to introduce Michael. Michael, how are you? Great. How are you? Absolutely wonderful. I'm glad we get a chance to connect today. And I'd like to start off with something that you did that made a major difference in the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce. And that is, is that you helped pioneer and brought in our partnership with Tesla for the charging station. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about that. And then let's dive into how you help companies tell their stories to make things like the Tesla deal happen. So how did that come about? How did you hear about the Green Chamber? And then how did you get involved in this, this Tesla project? Well, like, like most clients have a tendency to do at the 11th hour, you get a phone call this time from Michelle Thatcher who is our lovely head of the chamber. And um, she told me, hey, guess what? We're driving from Florida to New York for a big march on uh, climate change. And we're going to drive in a Tesla and we're going to charge it the entire way up there because we can do that without worrying about running out of power because they have these char this charging station footprint on the East Coast that allows you to get from Florida all the way to New York without worrying about it. And I thought that was pretty unique. And so I said to her, well, we, we need to call Tesla and see if they'd be willing to do a press release with us. And they were. They jumped up, uh, you know, they, they jumped on the opportunity. And in our conversations with Tesla, they told us that they had a program that they were working on to increase the overall footprint of their charging stations across the entire United States. So I said to the head of PR, um, we have a really big network of retail businesses and lodging and parks that are part of our part of our overall U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce network. Why don't we partner with you to extend that um, program, offer that program to all of our members? And it was just a, it, the synergy made so much sense. And so uh, we've been doing that and reaching out to our members with this program. And it's been pretty successful. Well, and I want to point out that this wasn't a pre-existing relationship that you had with Tesla. You know, you just basically said, all right, this is who we're going to have a conversation with. We're going to target them. You picked up the phone and made this happen. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I have always lived by the philosophy. The worst that anyone's going to say to you is no. So it's, you know, you might as well try because you never know what you're going to get. Well, I love it. And I want to say again, thank you on behalf of the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> And as these charging stations go across the country, if you're watching this and you are a business owner who has people who come stay at your place for three or four or more hours, so for example, theme parks, hotels, shopping malls, things like that, that's the kind of uh, deal where Tesla is saying, hey, we have a budget set aside to put in these charging stations. And they don't just work on Tesla cars, they work on all EV cars. Is that correct? Um, I, I, I'm not really sure of that. I, I think that's the case. I'm not 100% sure, but, um, but I, you know, uh, what I can say is that I've, it, the businesses in, in my community here that have 
that have used these charging stations, they've seen it draw more business to their businesses. So we're getting people that are driving electric vehicles come up to the river now that probably wouldn't have come up before because we're out here. We're about 15 miles away from the coast and 20 miles away from the 101. So the, they know that they can safely get out here and get back without worrying about having to charge their car. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you again. And let's talk about what you're up to, why you're here, what's the difference you're making in companies, and I believe in the world through your expertise, which is getting that communication out, getting that, that press to, to notice what a company is up to. So I'll, I'll allow you to take it away from here, but share with us a little bit about why you're here and what you're up to. Well, you know, I want to say one of the reasons why I'm here is because I really believe in the mission and the vision of the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce. I had the opportunity to meet with Michelle Thatcher a few years ago, and as she started talking about the U.S. Green Chamber, my business partner, Kate, and I knew exactly, knew immediately that we wanted to be, that we wanted to work with, with the team to help smaller businesses and larger businesses kind of tell their story. That's what we do. You know, we help companies tell their story, and we've been doing it for quite some time. Um, you know, I this first slide here is uh, why me? You know, why am I here? One of the main reasons I told you before is that we we really believe in the mission, the vision of the U.S. Green Chamber. But we what we've been doing for years for small businesses is helping them tell their story, and we have been from a technology standpoint, because we really focus heavily on startup companies and technology space, but the strategies and the programs that we put in place for our clients work across many, many industries. So um, we have seen uh, the PR world and the tech world and the economy in general go through the boom and then the bust, and now we're at what we call back again. So we have a thriving economy, but the landscape has changed considerably in the world of PR, um, especially within newsrooms, because with it, when we had the boom, we had all these magazines and all these newspapers and all these really huge um, uh, newsrooms where people were looking for stories. And you could write a story about the opening of an envelope and somebody would print it in the cover of the New York Times. Not exactly, but close enough. <laughs> and when the bust happened, and newsrooms got really small, reporters started getting very, very picky about what they were writing about. And you had to be very thoughtful and strategic in the way you told your story. So you had to understand the marketplace and you had to understand the competition. You had to be able to uh, talk about what makes you uh, different and better than the competition. Um, so those, those things became really important. And what I've learned and what Kate and I actually have learned in these 14 years that we've been in business and been through this boom, bust, and back again is that storytelling has changed considerably and it's a lot more strategic than it used to be. I love it. I know when you develop a core message for a company and then a unique selling proposition and then you finally get that to the media, that can really unify your team. It can accelerate your growth. It can also align customers with your business. And I know that that your company helps do all that with storytelling because I think sometimes small business owners might go, well, you know, at what stage do I do something like this? You know, I'm just getting started or whatever. But I believe that that developing that core message and core story in the beginning really helps position you for for greater success faster. Would you say that that's true in the small businesses you've worked with? Oh, most definitely. I I don't. I don't advise clients that are new to the marketplace or launching a new product, and even if they're already in the marketplace and launching a new product, that they do any discussion around the product, the technology, the differentiators, whatever it may be, until they've done a, a messaging analysis and until they've really sat down and thought about, how am I going to say this that, that is going to make me look different and make people re take note about what I'm launching or, or the service that I'm offering? Yeah, because it's 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 I've seen this so many times uh, with businesses and consulting companies that oftentimes what happens is, is that their message sounds exactly what you just said. It's a bunch of features and and that kind of thing, or how their technology is better. But their competitors are saying the same exact thing, and they're not working with the subconscious part of people's brains, which would get them to emotionally engage, which is what stories do when they're well told. So, yeah. So let's 
let's move on here and talk a little bit about kind of what's PR and what it isn't and why you need it. And I, I think this is pretty simple. You know, PR is public relations. It's, it's relating your message back to the public. And you do that through the media. Now, a lot of people sometimes confuse marketing, advertising, and PR. Marketing, think about marketing as kind of the overall umbrella. And that, and that houses advertising and public relations. And advertising is, is you telling your story in the way that you want to tell it in an ad or a banner ad, whether it's digital or in print or in television. PR is a little different. You're telling your story, but you're telling it to someone who's going to relate that story back to in a way that they editorialize it. That's one piece of what PR is. But just like there's a media mix in advertising, there's a mix in PR too. So we have press releases and pitches and editors that editorialize stories. But there are other tools as well to tell your story. There are speaking engagements. There are uh, the writing of writing and placement of byline articles. Um, just a number of ways, just like I said before, in the ad media mix, where you can tell your story and get it out there in the way that you really want to do that. So when you're when you're crafting that, do you help some of your clients figure out, well, the best platform for me is radio or TV or on stage or at a local community meeting or something like that? Is that part of, uh, do you get into the strategy with based on their- Of course, absolutely. So some of the things that you think about initially beyond the message is the target audience because the message is going to apply to who you're speaking to. So, um, and so then you choose the outlets that you're trying to, uh, where you want to tell your story based on what your target audience is. I like it. It's an idea that, mar that PR is a subset of marketing. It's a way to get your story out. And then it's also the, the strategies or tactics that you're using or the mediums that you get that out. What else? Exactly. Exactly. And just like I said before, similar to advertising, come up with your target market, come up with a message and come up with the way you're going to communicate it. So, you know, now that we kind of understand that, the question everyone has is, how do I get started? What do I do? And the, the big, the thing that I think is really important and it's, you know, who are you and who are they? This is like, I got to get to know myself and I got to get to know the competition. And so um, one of the things that we, we do with our clients is we work with them to develop competitive dossiers. So basically what that is, is it's a document that tells you about who your competitor is. And we use their website and who's been writing them about them in the news media to help populate that document. Once we have a dossier done on all of our competitors, then we do a dossier on ourselves. And you line those dossiers up on a table and you start to read them and you start to take note of the messages that your competitors are communicating, what they're saying about their products. And you do that across all of the competition. You do that with your dossier and you look at those keywords and you start to say, you know what, we're saying a lot of the same things that our competitors are saying. This is what we see all the time. This is what we end up telling our, our clients. We're seeing that you're saying a lot of the same things that your competitors are saying. How do we adjust that message so it's different? What haven't we looked at in your service or your product that we can highlight that we're not already highlighting? And a lot of times that sparks a lot of conversation. We also look more closely at what the marketplace is saying. So in addition to doing all that research on the competition and their products and services, we also look at who's writing about the competition. And when you do that, then you, you, you do two things for yourself. One is you start to build out your media list and you start to know who you have to be talking to. And then the other thing that you do is you get a better sense of what the marketplace is saying about, about the, about the, I'm sorry, what the editors are saying or editorial world is saying about the marketplace overall. That's really helpful when you move into the messaging development phase. Taking some notes here about the dossiers and then the media list. And I'd suggest if you're watching this and you're a business owner, this is great strategy right here to help you understand how to not only develop your message, but make sure that your message is going to get out and that you're going to be able to find the position in the marketplace because the, the worst thing you can do is have the same exact sound and feel. So let's say you're selling solar, for example, 
okay, well, most people understand the benefits of going solar. They understand the impact that it makes on the environment. They understand the, the cost, you know, the zero cost side of it now. But how does your company differentiate from the next guy that's installing solar that is calling them? So I really like this approach that you talk about because it's giving people tangible understanding of how to position themselves with the right PR. Right. Yeah, and so I, I put here that the case study we're going to talk about today is Unoodle. It's actually not Unoodle, Natural Currents Energy Services. So I apologize for that. But once we've done all of that competitive analysis and marketplace analysis, we go into the positioning phase. And the, the, a positioning statement is the first step you take when you're developing a messaging platform. It's the first step we take. Um, there's a book called Crossing the Chasm. Uh, it's by a guy named Jeffrey Moore. He's so intelligent and has put together this equation, I call it an equation, for developing a positioning statement. And this is really what we use to help start that messaging process. So it's for, so your target customers who must solve some specific problem. problem. You then talk about the product and what category you're in what your kind of benefit or key features are. Here's where you get into the differentiation. Unlike company A, company B, we have a product that does X, Y, Z. So it's a great way, a process oriented way for putting together a positioning statement. And I'm going to show you one right now. This is for natural currents energy services. So you see the four uh, natural for organizations that are looking for alternative sources of power. The company, which is natural current energy services, we tell you what it is, a leading U.S.-based green technology company producing revolutionary systems for emerging renewable energy markets with a primary focus on ocean tidal power generation. So that's what they focused on. They were in the renewable energy space, but they were focusing on ocean tidal power generation. So you're unlike, this is where you get into the differentiators, unlike other sources of alternative energy, natural Currents designs, manufactures, and installs innovative hydro turbine and wind powered equipment. So that was their big product differentiator. That's where they had their patent. That's what made them different and better than the competition. They believed, we believed. And so it allowed, obviously, these pieces of equipment to produce electricity from the movements of tide and water currents found in rivers, canals, and industrial flows. Now, I want to go to the industrial flows piece because while there were people to creating power from the currents of rivers and canals and oceans, industrial flows was one of their key differentiators. They had developed their turbine system so that they were very thin and could fit in pipes. And as, as water flowed out of uh, water treatment plants, for example, through these pipes, these turbines are spinning and creating energy. So the the, another great source of using the flow of water to create energy in, the, in an industrial space. Um, with its proprietary technology, unmatched title project expertise, they had done projects all over the world in very unique places, existing commercial hydro products and, pro products and exclusive rights to an extensive portfolio of ocean tidal projects, Natural Currents Energy Services is positioned as one of the leading tidal energy companies addressing coastline tidal power generation opportunities. Now, this is a mouthful, obviously, and maybe some of you are actually thinking that right now. But what I'll tell you is this. This is not, I, we never use this as something that will be public facing. This is the start. This is getting as much as you can on a piece of paper because in the case of words, you can have more and then cut out what you don't need. So what this allows us to do is get everything down in one place and then start to then start to parse the pieces out and build on them. So that's the goal here. Let's get everything down so that we have a very clear understanding of what this company is. And, and then let's start to clarify it, get, bring some clarity to it, talk in a little more detail about some of the specific parts that I was talking about before. That's how your messaging platform comes into, comes into shape. Yeah, this is a mouthful, but it's important for someone to go through this process to identify what are all the different components of your business. And like you said, then, then we have to transform that into something that the consumers can figure out what it actually means. Yeah. So 
So the next part, after you've kind of developed this overall messaging platform, now what do you do? You know, how do you start to tell your story? And we talked a little bit about this before. You want to start to think about your target audience and targeting the media. So the first thing you have to do is think about who your target customer is. And then what are they reading? Where are they going for their news and information as it relates to their everyday lives, but also as it relates to the businesses that they may be in that may be buying from you? Um, and then you have to familiarize yourself with the media outlets that are writing about those subjects and writing about writing to writing in a voice that is that resonates with that customer. Now you've already done some of this. If you followed the process that I've talked about and have developed those dossiers and done research on the on who's writing about the competition. So what we do, and let me dive a little bit deeper into that, what we do is we focus on six months to a year and we look at who's been writing about this competition for the last six months to a year, that starts to really build up our media list so we know here are the publications that are really talking about the specific industry that we're working with. That's a really helpful first start in targeting the media and developing a media list. And this is where we start to make our media and contact list. And it's always a living and breathing document. Newsrooms and magazines and people change jobs all the time. Things are happening in the media space on a, on a regular basis. People are coming and going, beats are changing, and you have to really, really stay on top of it because the one thing you don't want to do is email something to a reporter that isn't writing about a space anymore. They want to know that you know what they're writing about. So blanket emailing a bunch of reporters is never a really useful tool but sending very targeted email to reporters saying, hey, I know you write about the, the ocean tidal power generation space. I've seen articles you've written before. Here's a company that I think you might be interested in, or here's what we're doing that I think is really unique and interesting, and I'd love to get on the phone with you and talk a little bit more about it. Um, the other thing to remember is that when you're targeting the media, having a piece of news is really important. People come to me all the time and they say, I want a reporter to write about how awesome my company is. I'm like, great, I want somebody to give me a million dollars. Let's make it happen. It doesn't work that way. And so what you have to remember is that you're going to have more success taking a piece of news to a reporter than you will just taking your own story about how awesome you are. So let me make the distinction so you get it. Um, let's first talk about, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to that. I want to talk a little bit about a press release because this is where, this is how you tell your story in news format. So there are a couple of ways to do press releases. This is the traditional way. Develop a traditional press release that has a headline, a subhead, and then the story told in paragraphs ending in a boilerplate. There's a new way of doing press releases. More and more companies are in blog format where you create a blog on your website and instead of writing a press release, you write a story about the news that you're coming out with, and you use a link to that story in your pitch to the media. I will explain a little bit more about that as we move on, but let's talk about the writing of a press release, because I think this is really important. It's what people are most familiar with. So when you start to think about you're going to tell a story, and let's give an example, okay? Um, uh, well, here. Here's two examples. Uh, Natural Currents Energy Services, uh, they were identified top New Jersey tidal power generation sites. Uh, and then they were conducting this 18-month study, and they gotten grants from the New Jersey Department of Transportation and the University Transportation Research Center. The second piece of news was that Natural Currents Energy Services launches renewable energy business designed to establish tidal power generation as a primary green energy alternative. That was the main story. This was their launch announcement. And so we worked with this format here to create those press releases. So a headline, what's the news, a subhead, what's the secondary part of the news that will kind of highlight the story more. The first paragraph summed up the story. The second paragraph expanded on the detail. The first quote was from the CEO, and that provided some strategic positioning. And then some additional paragraphs that explain more about the company and the secondary messages. And then the, the last, the second quote is a credibility quote. It either comes from your partner or comes from an analyst in the marketplace 
or comes from another person within your business or comes from a client, who, what, whatever the structure of the news is or who, whatever the piece of news is and who you're talking about within your news, that's where that second quote should come from. And then the boilerplate tells your company's story and it's something that you use all the time. And we develop boilerplates based on that positioning statement that we first started with. So we take that positioning statement and we literally boil it down so that it's short and brief and to the point. So, so Michael, let me ask you a here's question real we, quick. So, then, go ahead. Yeah, so when somebody's heading down this, this path of PR, where they want to get the story out and the message out and really start to attract new business as a result of telling these stories, and maybe you cover this in a little bit, do I need to be thinking as the entrepreneur or the business owner how frequent I need to be telling my story? Is this something that I need to be telling daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly? So th th that's a really good question and something that we talk to our clients all the time about. You know, a lot of times people will come to us and say, I have this big piece of news and I want to tell it. And they expect that that piece of news is going to cycle over a longer period of time than what it actually will. We have to remember something about the news these days. It's available 24 seven. And the news media is constantly looking for a new angle or for a new story to tell. So in that vein, we have come up with this kind of theme, which is PR is a drum beat and not a drum roll. You have to constantly be beating the drum. And I love it when I can come out with something for a client that's important and relevant every other week. That would be great. It doesn't always work that way. That's why that you have that PR media mix that I was talking about before. So your drum beat, you can be beating on a bunch of different, different drums. Think about a drummer with a bunch of different drum sets. He's got his press release drum, drum over here. He's got his speaking engagement drum over here. He's got his byline drum over here. And so he's beating each of those at certain times to continually tell that story. That's a really important way to think about it. And I think that um, if you can be constantly finding ways to tell your story without replicating what you're currently talking about or replicating it but in a different environment, that's a great way to continue to beat that drum. Very good question. You're reminding me of uh, when Tony Zappo or uh, Tony Shea at Zappos really you know started the marketing side of Zappos. They already had the business going, but they weren't getting the, the word out as much. And he got on a friend of mine's stage, Tony Robbins. So he spoke to that audience there. And because he was on that stage, he then got onto a bunch of other stages. I just saw him speaking in an event in Las Vegas, uh, a technology conference. And his book came out on delivering happiness. And so he got on a bunch of uh, podcasts and blogs and this and that. And, and the press release about what the company was doing and he was doing and all this, it, like you said, it was a constant beating of the drum. And next thing you know, everybody knew about Zappos. Even though they had already been in business for a while, it's like he became the conversation, uh, not just in the media, but in all kinds of businesses for a while. So that's a great example of the drum beat uh, hitting all those different you know, drums. Yeah, I'm going to jump to something really quick because you brought up Tony Shea, and I think that it's really, I think that this is a really interesting example of something that we recently did for a client. You may or may not remember a few, maybe about a month and a half ago, Zappos came out with their announcement about running the business as a holacracy and giving people the option to stay or go. Do you remember that? I was, yeah, actually, Tony mentioned that on stage. He said, I just sent the email out. It was on a Thursday. And uh, he goes, I just sent this email out. I want to read it to you guys. So I, I yeah, that's great. I was so I woke up the next morning and I'm reading a story about holacracy. And I thought to myself, you know, our client, a company called Echo, E-K-H-O, not E-C-H-O, but E-K-H-O, a marketing tech company and a product development platform company, they run their business as a holacracy. And the CEO is very passionate about holacracy. And so I got on the phone with him and I said, you know, Kent, we really need to be telling this story about Echo and holacracy. You run your organization so interestingly and you have a perspective on it and it's going to be a topic of conversation in the media. Now the reason why I'm telling you this is because this is part of that whole drum beat where 
Echo, in addition to wanting to tell the story about their business, they wanted to tell the story or tell the story about their products and services. They also want to tell the story about how they run their business because it's unique, because they're also recruiting people. So telling the story about running their business as a holacracy would be a great way for people to come back to them and say, I really love the way you run your business. I'm really interested in possibly working for you. So we started beating that holacracy drum. Kent wrote a piece on his vision and what holacracy means to him and to, the, and to Echo, and that got placed on CNBC as an op-ed. So all of a sudden, Kent is on this major platform talking about holacracy and being positioned as an expert in that space. So you have to really look beyond just what's inside your own company, what's happening outside of your company, and how those trends and what's happening outside can be applied directly to what you're doing and how you can comment on that. I love it. And I think the key point here is, is to have someone who is responsible for your PR, who's always got their finger on the pulse and thinking about your business. Because I know you just triggered something for me in a, in a startup that we're launching actually in the next couple of weeks. And that same conversation would work with ours. And I would imagine, you know, with a lot of other companies, how do you run your business? Uh, because you're going to attract business owners, you're going to attract potential employees, strategic partners, uh, and then, of course, the media. Right, exactly. So let's jump to this um, slide here, because I think this is one of the, one of the, a unique way to think about news. We've had, we had natural currents, nat I'm just going to say NC. <laughs> it's too much to say. Um, we had NC launching officially in the marketplace. We also had um, the Community College of New York at partnering with NC to identify top New Jersey title power generation sites. So um, this, was a, these, this was two really interesting pieces of news. The, the challenge that we had with the first, with the second announcement here, the Natural Currents Energy Services launching their business, was that nobody had heard about it before. And so I knew that at the same time, they would be announcing this partnership with CCNY and releasing kind of the study uh, or starting this study um, with the New Jersey Department of Transportation to identify specific sites that would be great for title power generation. So I said to the CEO, let's announce them both at the same time. And he said, well, I don't see why that makes sense. And I said, well, here's why. You don't have any credibility in the marketplace. Nobody knows who you are. You have a great technology. It's really unique and it's ready for prime time. But if I asked anyone on the street who Natural Currents Energy Services is, people would probably say, I don't know who they are. Same thing probably in your overall kind of business marketplace, in the sustainability marketplace. While people know who you are because you've been speaking at conferences, you're not widely known or well known. So a partnership announcement, in addition to your uh, launch announcement, would go really far. And it was a great way for us to tell the story about the company while lending credibility and showing that they had momentum in the marketplace. And I think what you're also doing is you're positioning them in the marketplace too. Somebody who has no, you know, really no position you're helping position them in, a, in the marketplace, which I think is invaluable, uh, makes it so much easier to sell your products and services. People think that you are in the pole position or you're an expert or something like that. And as soon as media and press picks it up, you know, other business owners go, oh, yeah, they own it. It's almost like, oh, I read it, so it must be true kind of thing. We, we doubt that a little bit more nowadays. But I think if people see it over and over again, then, then they have a tendency to believe it. Yeah. And, you know, I've gone back and forth in this next slide, talked a little bit about a lot, many of these things. Um, but I want to say that, that that strategy or that kind of tactic I was just discussing before, I call blend and weave. It's taking two stories, blending them together and weaving them into something that's going to be really relevant for the company and relevant for the marketplace and help to um, position them as as a player, which is super important. You know, as you're, you've, once you develop your press release, you have to develop your pitch. You have to figure out, how am I going to tell this story so that it's really unique? And that's exactly what we did with those two press releases. 
we looked at what's trending. Obviously, at the time when natural currents launched, really, obviously, sustainability is still trending, but it's, it was really trending hard at that time. A lot of people were talking about um, green tech. A lot of people were talking about sustainability. And so it was important for us to find a way to, to pitch it so that it's relevant and timely. And that's what we were exactly what we were doing with that story. Um, and what we really did, in addition to kind of um, fleshing out that story, is we fleshed out other stories so, and figured out where we take those stories. So we had the company launch announcement, green tech news and water news, the New Jersey installation, uh, that was regional news, so we could reach out to uh, New Jersey publications. Job creation was an important uh, message in that announcement. That was regional news. Um, one of the areas that they had identified uh, was Point Pleasant Beach. I call that hyper-local news, so the Point Pleasant News or the Point Pleasant Times, we were able to tell that. And then the partnership with CCNY, that's some collegiate news and some more green tech news. So. You have to look at all of the different ways you can tell the story and then where you take that story. And that's exactly what you do with your pitch. And so you end up writing multiple pitches. I, I love it. And I love that you're calendaring here. So you're giving you know, multiple opportunities like we talked about. And I think that that's important for people. Um, you don't have to answer this now, but I do come back at some point and find out what are some of the mistakes? Because I'm sitting here as an entrepreneur and I'm going, okay, so he's giving me the strategy. Uh, at some point, can you share some of the biggest mistakes you've seen businesses make uh, in their PR? Like, oh my gosh, you should never do this kind of thing. And I know it's not part of what we had discussed prior, but I'd, I'd love to know at some point, what are some of the mistakes that people make when they're, um, when they're getting into PR? I think the biggest mistake is not really understanding the marketplace. If you don't get what, you're, what your other people are doing in your marketplace, you can't speak to the competition, you can't tell people why you're different, what makes your technology defensible, um, not being direct. Uh, if you can't do those things, then you, you're, you're out of luck because Reporters will read right through that. It's a job, it, the reporter's job is to, is to not just write, like I said before, not just write a story about this great company, but also balance that with other information about the marketplace. So if you have and know all that information and can feed that to a reporter, it makes their job much easier and it will make you much more successful in your PR efforts. So it's part of your job then to educate them, make it easy for them to learn and then position you? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, if you're talking to reporters that write about a specific marketplace, so let's talk about Anthony Ha at TechCrunch. He writes about marketing technology. That's his job. So he knows MarTech. And so if we take a story about marketing technology to, to Anthony Ha, there's not a lot of education I need to do for him. He might say to me, you know, I've never heard of that company before. What exactly do they do? And who are they directly competing with? Once you give him little, bit of, little bits of information, he more than likely can come back and say, okay, I understand. I get, I get this. Um, and then you move into the interview phase and he sits down with the CEO and with other people within the organization and they start to tell him a bigger story. Then he goes and does more research and he writes a very, very, um, fair uh, and balanced story because he's not just talking about your company, he's talking about you as you relate to the marketplace overall. And that's what every reporter should do. I love it. All right. Again, it goes back to knowing, knowing your media and who those relationships are and what they want or need in order to, to present your company. Exactly. So let's talk a little bit about the, the other parts of that mix. So we talked about it before, but I mentioned earlier byline articles and gave you the example of, um, of, uh, of uh, Polocracy and um, Echo and CNBC. Then there are speaking engagements. So every industry has its own uh, cadre of speaking engagements. You should be looking into where you can be telling your story to a larger marketplace, sitting on panels, uh, being in trade shows. Those things are really important. Um, expanding reach through social media. Uh, one of the things that every business should do, I think, is create a Twitter profile, create a Facebook profile, 
Uh, create an Instagram account. If your business is very visual, Instagram is a great way to tell your story. And then every time an article comes out about you, you need to post that article. So, because again, we're looking for credibility. When you post the article, post the Twitter, prof the, the Twitter handle of the newspaper or post the Twitter handle of the person that wrote the story, they may retweet it. As they retweet it, everybody in their world might see it and they might start following you. So you want to start building up your social media profile. That's a great way to do it. The other thing to do is follow like-minded people. There is a service called wefollow.com. You can use wefollow to find out who are the top people posting articles about green energy or sustainable energy or recycling or composting or whatever it is that uh, is related to your industry. Wefollow.com can help you identify who those people are and then you can start following those people. And as you tweet to them directly or as you tweet stories, they may follow you back again, building up your presence. You need to participate in the community. There are, there are great programs out there that allow you to do that. Draper University is a really good example. It's a seven week program for entrepreneurs uh, that teaches you kind of the ins and outs of Silicon Valley. But they also have speaking engagements. It's very localized, it happens in Silicon Valley. So if you don't live there, it's a little harder to participate. But the great thing about the programs that they do or the, um, or the big panel discussions that they do is that they do them live stream. So if you're in Papua New Guinea or Peoria or Pittsburgh, you can watch those events of theirs. They're, they're very unique and they, do, they, have, they have great panels. The one that they just did was on women in Silicon Valley. It was all about women in technology and women engineers. Obviously, we have a lot of women engineers working in uh, the green space and green tech. So uh, that, that, you know, really interesting and they're archived. So you can go back and watch all of them. So check out Draper University. Um, there are other programs out there too that allow you to uh, participate in communities in Latin America. There's a program called Startup Chile. They have a one. They have wonderful resources on their sites for entrepreneurs. Um, and then of course there's South by Southwest. Really, really unique, uh, great opportunities to kind of learn a little bit more about what's going on out there in the entrepreneurial space. And then again, networking within your own community is super important as well. Um, and then listen and learn from your peers. Uh, a great example of doing that is listening to companies pitch their businesses and tell their stories. So there are a lot of pitch competitions out there and it's a great way to listen to the way people are telling their stories. Unoodle, uh, a client of ours, has a program called Unoodle Live. They invite people within their network to tell their stories and to pitch their businesses. And you know what, this gives me an idea we should be doing this at the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce. I think it would be a great way for people to get out there and do it in a format just like this. Um, this is how uh, uh, Unoodle does it. They live stream it and they let people come on and kind of tell the story of what their business is all about. Um, so something we need to put a note about talking to Michelle about, Jim, because I think it would be uh, super unique. Yep, there we go. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's, I don't want to say that's it. There's a lot more that goes to it, but that's the basic gist of telling your story in the world of public relations and, and how it works. This is fantastic. I have, I have filled up a page of notes, and one of the things, um, again, because I know we're having people at all different levels of business watch these webinars, and I want to just clarify, because somebody could be go, oh my gosh, I'm not sure what you or where to go. There, there's really four things that you can do here. Number one, you can do it yourself, right? So your option is, is to take what Michael's teaching, go through the learning curve and try to do it yourself. Number two is to get it done for you. So hire an expert, somebody who's got 14 plus years in this, who has the contacts, who has the knowledge, who knows what to do and more importantly, what not to do to get you to the, your success goal the fastest. So number two is to um, get it done for you. Number three is to collaborate, you know, so uh, to do it with someone. So do it yourself, get it done for you, do it with someone. Or the fourth way is don't do it at all. And one of the challenges that entrepreneurs have is called bandwidth. And in the beginning of your business, you have to understand, especially from zero to a million, your primary goal is to drive audience and drive revenues. So PR is a great way to do that. But you've got to take a look at your business and say, okay, do I want to do this myself? Do I want to have someone 
uh, do it for me? Do I want to collaborate and do it together? Or do I just say not right now? And this is an important distinction because doing something part way is worse than not doing it at all. So if you're going to dive into this, learn it, get it done and, and use it as an effective tool to beat that drum. As, as Michael was saying, I'm a huge fan of it and I love press because it makes your job easier. It positions you, it drives audience, it drives potential um, employees. It drives strategic partnerships. You know, I'll tell you, what's the first thing most people do nowadays when they meet somebody new? Google you. And it would be fantastic to not just pull up your URL, but to pull up, you know, 10 stories of things that you're doing to impact your, your society, your community, uh, your industry, uh, these kind of things. So I think it's, it's incredibly valuable. Definitely agree. And, you know, I, I have to say thank you so much for inviting me to, to tell my story about storytelling. I, I really love to talk about it and um, I'm always available to answer any questions. So if people want to send questions into the chamber and I'm more than happy to answer those, let's make it, let's make it happen. Absolutely. And Michael, I want to thank you. I know we had a little challenge getting this uh, coordinated and scheduled and you're a champion and I know you're committed to your clients and I really appreciate the work you're doing with the Green Chamber. So people can reach out. Michael is one of our partners and sponsors. He's really helping us at the U.S. Green Chamber get our message out. And if his company can help you, I, I would highly encourage you to at least make a phone call and connect with them. Uh, the U.S. Green Chamber is super excited to, to have anyone who's watching these webinars also join our team, whether that's in a membership role, uh, whether you want to sponsor uh, the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce, whether you want to become an advisor or on one of our committees. We currently have a focus of 100 cities with 1,000 businesses in each of those 100 cities. That's 100,000 businesses that are wanting to have the triple bottom line, people, planet, and profit. So, uh, Michael's helping us beat that drum. He's helping us get the message out there. Uh, and webinars is one of our drum beats, right? <laughs> yep. Perfect. So, Michael, anything you want to say in closing as we wrap up? I want to say thanks. I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to, to chat today. And I also thank the U.S. Screen Chamber for all the hard work you're doing. Thank you. We really appreciate you and your team and everything you've done for us. This is Jim Bunch, Chairman of the Board, saying until we connect again, have fun and remember, it's your choice to create your ultimate business. Bye for now.